Hello, everyone. Welcome to this podcast introduction to this week's Thomas Jefferson. Now, this one features my friend Dave McAndry, and we've been talking, kind of giving a report card on the Enlightenment. And, you know, this was unrehearsed, uh, David. I thought it was a really rich and interesting conversation. Uh, I, I hope you agree that the, the, this this really amounted to something, trying to assess where we are and using some practical uh, situations, uh, Brittany Griner and the the Trump uh, January 6th situation and so on, that trying to say, well, even in Russia, with all of its terrible problems, the Enlightenment sort of held. She was not killed or tortured, we don't think. She was returned in, a, in, a, in an exchange, that, that she had an actual trial, that, that this is the triumph of the Enlightenment, however imperfectly it's embodied in Russia. Yeah, I thought we, we did indeed cover a lot of ground, Clay, uh, starting with that episode, uh, uh, there was a certain floor of, uh, of uh, accustomed behavior uh, that, uh, that the uh, uh, Russian government, Putin government, uh, 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 subscribed to that uh, uh, previous uh, 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 versions uh, of governance of uh, of that landmass might may not have uh, uh, subscribed to, although as I, but it's a pretty pretty low floor nonetheless. On the other hand, it, it speaks highly to our ethical values, uh, and the uh, I think ultimately and it's something we get we lose sight of, the value and meaning of citizenship in an Enlightenment republic is something to be treasured. And there's a situation in the Iliad where. Uh, Diomedes and another, uh, he's Greek, and the Trojan counterpart meet, and they exchange armor because they turned out that their fathers or grandfathers were guest friends, and that means they can't fight, so they exchange armor. And um, and I think it's Glaucus trades his gold armor for bronze, and so it's a mismatch. And I think this happened here too. You know, there are plenty of people, and I think they have a point of view that say, letting that spy go, who was an arms merchant who helped Russia be the kind of the military bully that it is releasing him for a what a, a a ball player is is not equivalent enough to be justified but i look at it in exactly the opposite way and i wonder how you look at it i think it's a monument to america that we were willing to take the worst bargain from that point of view from a geopolitical point of view because we care so much about an innocent or seemingly innocent citizen who's been unfairly incarcerated in a, in a in an autocratic country it made me feel glad to be an American. And I get it that 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 was a pretty big exchange, and we may it may come back to haunt us in some way. But but what do you think? Well, it wasn't a fair trade in right. the sense of uh, proportional balance, but it was at the same time it was a fair trade. Uh, in that uh, we we got one of our uh, one of our citizens back, so um, uh, you always have to worry about uh, negotiating in situations like this. I think uh, uh, Brittany Griner herself has an interesting opportunity here. Uh, uh, for she more than any other individual imaginable could. I mean, what better proponent play? Can you imagine being an advocate for the release of that other fellow that's held in captivity over there than if Brittany Griner were to make it a cause? I mean, it would, it would, that would truly be an exciting moment in American history, I think. I hope she does it. I hope that this um, has a, that I don't say that she becomes more mature. I think that's unfair. I hope that this deepens her character if I were in this situation and, and I was going to be languish in that Russian gulag for 10 years and my country found a way to get me back, I would get down on my hands and knees and kiss the tarmac when I got home and say, thank God for the Enlightenment. Thank God for the United States of America. Uh, it just seems to me that that this is a great moment for her and for this country. And I know that some people say, well, yeah, but she kneels at during the national anthem, and she's been an outspoken um, uh, critic of, of American policing and so on. I get that, but I don't think that her duty now is to conform. I think her duty is to is to find greater depth. Yes, I, I think there's great power in gestures and her 
comportment with the, uh, with the national anthem is a gesture. Some people would agree with it, some wouldn't. But it's customary in the sporting world, as you would be familiar with, Clay, uh, if somebody dies, to put the initials of that individual on their on their sleeve or, or on their uh, somewhere on their uniform or their helmet, if it, in the case of a football player. So I, I think it's Mr. Sheehan who's still in captivity. I think that's his name. Whalen is the is the is the specific guy's name. Whalen. Whalen. That's right. Whalen. Yes. So imagine the jet, the power of the gesture of Brittany Griner putting that man's initials on her uniform. It would be immense. It's all she has to do. She could lead, I mean, at, you know, at the games, I've seen a few of them this year, they say, you know, return Brittany and we want BG back. And, you know, there's been a huge outpouring, not just in the WNBA, but in other sports, including the NBA itself. You know, if they all now would adopt release Whalen, that would be an incredible PR move, but that's not the reason to do it. The reason to do it is that it's important. And if you're Waylon, and I don't know Waylon's story, you know, it's possible that he is a spy. I don't know that we know everything we need to know about this, but let's assume that he's essentially innocent, which I hope he is. He has a reason to be pretty disgruntled, thinking, well, I'm no celebrity. I'm no famous ball player. Uh, I'm just a guy, and no one's releasing me. But because she's a national celebrity, we have a national um fit over this and we we trade more than maybe we should have to get her back he has every reason i think to be disgruntled whatever he says publicly i i agree but that's why it's incumbent upon Brittany griner to elevate his cause and uh and hopefully with the sufficient diligence and uh, diplomatic and other kinds of leverage he can be returned just as she was People can go to the Jefferson Hour uh, for um, more information about my cultural tours, about online courses, about the summer Lewis and Clark stuff. It's jeffersonhour.com. Uh, just one more thing. I don't want to dwell on this, uh, Dave, but uh, it seems to me that sports have emerged as a fascinating crucible of the national conversation. After George Floyd was killed, I will never forget watching one of the sports programs. Uh, sports center maybe and they had several african-american athletes on and they said something like you white people don't have to have the talk with your sons we have to have the talk with our sons every time they leave the house if you should be stopped be extremely cautious about your gestures don't do anything erratic you might be killed you might be you might not come home tonight and they said you white people don't understand what it is to be black in this country and i i watched all the fox and msnbc and cnn stuff i didn't hear anything more powerful than the commentary by black athletes on that occasion and now you have this with Brittany griner and it generated a conversation in sports circles you know this of, of, of a high level of sophistication and intelligence about prisons, about athletes, about celebrity, about exchanges, about incarceration. Uh, do you agree with me that sports has become, or maybe it's always been, but become this crucible of the conversation? Uh, I, I, it's, a, it's having a healthy rebound in influence. <clears throat> but um, I would say that it's not entirely novel, and I think it was uh, a previous generation, maybe two generations previously, where we've seen athletics take on, I won't, I won't say disproportionate influence in the shape of subsequent events. But more but than that, you would expect. More than more, you would expect. But more than you would expect. And Muhammad I'm Ali and the, three, the athletes in Mexico City among them. Well, there's some Muhammad Ali, also Bill Russell, Jim Brown, and Ali had a joint press conference in Cleveland in 1964, I think, or even going back further, Jackie Robinson. Uh, I think there's a direct correlation between Jackie Robinson, Truman's integration of the United States Armed Forces, and the burgeoning of the civil rights movement in the early 1950s, Brown versus Board of Education. I honestly believe, Clay, you can draw a, historia, a, a, a historical genealogy from 
the bravery of a single athlete. Let's, um, let's, let's end with this. We're going to go to the show. It's about much more than Brittany Griner, but I'm fascinated because I know you have a real commitment to sports and I learn from you every time we talk about this. And I think, I do think it's a really apt a metaphor for the, the place of the enlightenment in our time. However, um, uh, threadbare it is in some respects. My daughter, not, I think, original, um, but my daughter said, if it had been LeBron James, he would have been back in 72 hours. What do you say to that? I don't think so. Not because of any lack of interest on our part. Uh, and, and in fact, I might actually argue the opposite. He would have been considered more of a prize and they might have demanded a higher ransom. Absolutely. So one thing I thought about this when it was all happening was that at some point the Russian authorities, it wouldn't be their judicial system, it would be at a higher level than that, right? But at some point the Russian authorities said, oh, for goodness sake, she's an athlete. You know, let's not let her become the, the pivot of this massive geopolitical struggle we're in with the United States. That it's it's just not right. Let's just get her home and let's fight a different kind of battle with the US. Yes, that was a calculation on their part, but it must also be said, Clay, there was a calculation for the timing of that in this country, because I don't think it's a coincidence that this deal went down after the midterm elections because of some wariness about how this might play. So- uh, Something to think about for our next conversation. Fair enough. The Zelensky coming to this country, the first country he has visited since the war began, and are giving Patriot missiles to Ukraine, Putin has said he would regard that as an act of war. I worry, as a student of history, having looked at August 1914, for example, of how nations blunder without really understanding how the blunders are going to come out into conflagrations. And I, I think it would be surprising to me if Vladimir Putin doesn't now do something that outrages NATO and the United States in direct response to Zelensky's coming here and those Patriot missiles being released simultaneously. Possibly, Clay, and of course there's no way of knowing, but... Um... But there's analogies that work both ways. Uh, there's the August Guns of August 1914 analogy, but there's also Munich 1938 analogy. And by attempting to avoid confrontation, in fact, all you do is bring it about. So myself, I think on balance, my view is that Putin is engaging in a lot of bluff. I hope I'm right about that. We won't know uh, until events play out, but I think that's an idle threat. And whatever else the Ukraine, the war in Ukraine has shown, it's that the vaunted Soviet non-nuclear military array is a lot less than meets the eye. That's a permanent setback, I think, for Russia, or at least for decades. Last last question is is truly a yes or no question. We'll see if you can do it. You get the last word, but it is a yes and no question. And thanks, everybody. We'll go to the show after this. I think this is the most dangerous moment since October 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis. Yes or no? No. You've been listening to Dave Nicandri of Washington State. Always more sensible, cautious, and moderate than I am. We'll see you all next time, but let's go to the show, The Enlightenment, a track record, 2022. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this special edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. I'm Clay Jenkinson. The Jefferson Hour, also known as Listening to America. David Swenson's on a break. I'm hosting today, and I'm talking with a fellow member of what we like to call the Republic of Letters, uh, the, the, the sort of informal community of, of like-minded people who believe in the Enlightenment and believe in the rule of law and the 
dissemination of ideas and the measurement of the universe and um, who believe that reason and science are the centerpiece of a complete life. This is my friend David McCandry, formerly the director of the Washington State Historical Society. David, I want to review 2022 in terms of the status of the Enlightenment. Now, that may seem like a kind of a strange thing, but let's start this way. In a, in a nutshell, how would you define the Enlightenment? I'll, I'll set the dates. Let's say 1680 to 1826. How would you define it? Well, there's um, several strands of the Enlightenment. Uh, there's uh, uh, the scientific section, uh, the, uh, all, all the sciences, um, astronomy, biology, what was known as natural history during the course of the, of the Enlightenment. And then there's kind of the moral philosophy aspect of the Enlightenment. Uh, Jefferson was an is an intriguing figure because he's one of the few who has a foot in both sides. Uh, the Declaration of Independence and all he wrote about democracy and popular will uh, is an aspect of moral philosophy. And having commissioned the Lewis and Clark expedition, uh, he, uh, the, the empirical aspect of that strikes right to the scientific strand, right, gets right to the heart of what, what it was about. So Lewis on his birthday in 1805, Meriwether Lewis out in Western Montana, writes this really interesting, somewhat um, um, lugubrious birthday reflection and says that thus far he has not advanced the information of succeeding ages or ameliorated the condition of mankind. So there they are, the two principal things of the Enlightenment, to make life better for actual people in practical terms on Earth by way of liberating them from oppressions and superstitions and unreason and bad institutions and to accumulate knowledge and disseminate it to a world that's hungry for knowledge. And Lewis uh, is too hard on himself. He was actually doing both in considerable measure, but, but I think you'll agree that's sort of the program of the Enlightenment. Yeah. Um, it, yes, it's, uh, I mean, one of the, um, uh, phrases one sees on the literature of the time. It appears in the founding documents of learned societies, and uh, it's, a, it's replete in the correspondence of a figure like Jefferson or Joseph Banks and Cook and Lewis and the whole, the whole micro universe of, of figures. Um, the increase in diffusion of knowledge. I mean, that, that, that language, although the Smithsonian dates from a later period, uh, that is in the mission statement of, of, of the Smithsonian Institution. And that sentiment is actually grounded in uh, the, the ethos of the Enlightenment, kind of the preceding era. I, uh, the the um, Smithsonian, I think, it was founded... Um, 1850s, the, right? Well, 18, early 1840s, I think, maybe in the late 1830s with the Smithson bequest. But Enlightenment culture... Um, I mean, there, there's so many aspects of it um, uh, that uh, the, the learned journal, uh, uh, the scholarly debate, uh, getting together over a glass of wine or, or a cup of coffee, um, uh, civil discourse, uh, uh, ex exploration of ideas. Um, uh, it's, um, it's, um, Actually, I think of the Enlightenment period generally as kind of the high point of human civilization writ large. Me too. And of course, it doesn't end um, as, a, as a formal movement. It maybe ends by around 1826. I use that date as the death of Jefferson and John Adams. But, but Enlightenment programs continue. So you think of Linnaean binomial classification and the classification of, of everything, which culminates in our time in the cracking of the DNA code. You think of exploration. Lewis and Clark, Captain Cook, etc. But it culminates in our time with uh, space probes to Mars uh, or our, our plan to return to the moon. You think of encyclopedia, you know, the, the Diderot and the French encyclopedia or the almanacs of the time, the beginnings of what would become the Encyclopedia Britannica. Now we have Wikipedia and many other online en encyclopedias. And Wikipedia alone has millions, literally millions of articles in English alone. So that tradition continues in medicine. Um, you know, breakthroughs of, of almost incalculable importance since the age of Jefferson, but also government, due process, 
uh, habeas corpus, um, uh, checks and balances, uh, the rule of law, the concept that there's nobody above the law, et cetera. These are all part and parcel of what we like to call the enlightenment. And I will just say, and I think you will agree, I would rather live under the aegis of the enlightenment than any other model of human life on earth possible. Well, um, it's been said that disagreement makes for good radio play. <laughs> so I, 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 not a disagreement, but a quibble. Uh, because there, there were not only kind of disciplinary divergences with the Enlightenment, there were also national divergences. Now we've, so what I'm about to say will open a door that you and I have walked through many times. And I think you and I would walk through a, a different one. Um, I'm, I feel I would be quite at home with the British Enlightenment. I think you, principally because of your love and interest in Thomas Jefferson, are more an enthusiast for the French Enlightenment, and those are distinctly different things. You agree, surely. And you've left out an even uh, important, a very important third element, the Scottish Enlightenment. Maybe you, maybe that was under your aegis of the, yes. the British Enlightenment, but the Scottish Enlightenment probably had a more immediate effect on Jefferson and the American patriots of the revolutionary period than even the English or French Enlightenments. But do you agree we've sort of we've sort of mapped out what the Enlightenment is? I think so. Except I'll, I'll just I'll just again quibble <laughs> with one thing. Uh, and of course, Jefferson and the founding fathers drew on both strings. But the line, a line, so resonant in American history, that's in the Declaration of Independence, the pursuit of happiness, that is purely, that taps into the fountainhead of the French Enlightenment. The British or Scot Scottish Enlightenment, um, they were interested in improving life, but they had no, the French Enlightenment had certain utopian, super idealistic notions of what was possible. I think the British Enlightenment, certainly interested in improving life, learning natural processes, but they were under no illusion about being able to perfect life on earth. I, I, would, I would just offer that as a slight counter argument. And two things, one is that Jefferson's three heroes, uh, which he articulates specifically were Bacon, Locke, and Newton, all British figures, uh, Francis Bacon, John Locke and Isaac Newton. He said, my trinity of heroes. I would say my chief weakness as a, as a historian and, and, and public scholar is that I'm, uh, that I'm susceptible to utopianism. Um, I'm an idealist. I believe that if we lived in a Jeffersonian country, minus the race problem, that we would be dramatically, maybe infinitely better off than we were. I do believe in the perfectibility of humankind in spite of all the evidence. Uh, I, I believe that the United States could have been, and in some sense is the shining city on the hill of the, the sort of the class act of the modern world. And I, I think that, that when it ceases to be so or, or erodes, it's exceedingly painful to me. And so I, I think that slightly differentiates us. I think you're less susceptible to utopianism. Yeah, I, th I think that's fair. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm a gradualist at heart. I want to make society better. I, I, the people, the, the writers, the politi political figures, uh, the, the ones that uh, 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 offer uh, graduated, uh, uh, propose a graduated sense of improvement. I, I think that's Lockean in nature. I mean, maybe that's grandiose of me to say so, but, uh, but uh, uh, let's just uh, let, let make constant improvement. Um, uh, and, and that I think uh, is, uh, is not necessarily, well, I think at root, maybe it is an anti-utopian. I, I just find that to be uh, an unreachable goal. Fair enough. We're talking about the enlightenment. We're going to do a little reality check on the status of the enlightenment in this, the third decade of the 21st century. It's been a rough time, I think, for enlightenment principles and for the idea of the enlightenment itself you're listening to a special edition of the thomas jefferson hour with my friend and guest 
Dave McCandry of the state of Washington. He's always our enlightenment correspondent when there are eclipses or um, the transit of Venus or um, boats and ships discovered uh, from Captain uh, Cook or from Shackleton. Whenever there's an enlightenment subject of any sort, I contact Dave McCandry and we're listening to a conversation we are having at the beginning of three. We'll be back in just a moment. You are listening to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to this special edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, also known as Listening to America. I'm talking with Dave DeCantry of Washington State, formerly the director of the Washington State Historical Society, the author of three books so far and more to come, two of them on Lewis and Clark and one of them on Captain James Cook. So, Dave, the, in my opinion, the Enlightenment is in trouble, and it's in trouble for a number of reasons. One is that we've taken it for granted these things like habeas corpus and rule of law and separation of powers and checks and balances and so on. And it turns out you can't take them for granted, that they have to be, there have to be new transfusions of commitment to those principles all the time for them to hold up. And I think we saw in the last four or five years, a real challenge to those enlightenment principles, not just in the United States, but in Hungary and several South American republics in Great Britain itself. The other thing is that the academic elite at our, our most prestigious universities seem to have come into a period where they are so disillusioned with the Enlightenment, or maybe with everything, that they're calling into question the principles that we most admire and say, no, it's all just a barrage of agreeable sounding language that covers the same old human condition of power, oppressing anybody that it can, and ambition, racism, and sexism, and homophobia, that the Enlightenment is essentially a sham. I don't think that's too uh, much of an exaggeration of where some elements of the academic elite are. What do you make of this sort of pell-mell retreat from the Enlightenment? Well, there again, Clay, I think it's, it's a retreat from only half of the Enlightenment agenda. The practical en Enlightenment, the Enlightenment of the inventors, Franklin's the quintessential figure, stoves, bifocals, lightning rods. I think there's there's a genuine openness, although even there, there, there might be some backpedaling because there's, there's, there is kind of an anti-technological strain that's uh, current. So I think the, uh, the practical, the goals of the practical enlightenment are still alive and well. It's what I described earlier as the moral philosophical aspects of the enlightenment. The, the, the uh, political theory of the Enlightenment, that's, that's what's under assault. And um, it's, it, it's definitely troubling. Was there much of that in agenda of Lewis and Captain Cook? Was that a cover story for imperial ambitions? Yeah, one, one could say that. I don't think it's the sum total of what ventures like that were about. By the same token, I think we, uh, we take so much for granted certain traditions, the constitutional provisions, the notion of free speech, habeas corpus, as you have said, all of that is very much taken for granted, the notion of individual rights. I mean, it has to be stated, these are Enlightenment era ideas. They didn't originate in a seminar of modern literary theory 20 years ago at some uh, Ivy League institution. They, they go way back, they have their roots in this era. And so I think Whereas there still seems to be an eagerness for practical outcomes, for the quest for knowledge, these new telescopes and you know scientific experiment, the few, recent fusion experiment, there's still kind of an eagerness on that side, but we've completely taken for granted some of the fundamental notions that were on, again, the moral philosophical side of the Enlightenment. Uh, we're talking to David McCandry, uh, formerly the director of the Washington State Historical Society, the author of two books on Lewis and Clark, and one on Captain James Cook, always our favorite Enlightenment correspondent. Let me give you a perfect example of this, and let's talk about it in several different ways. I know you know a lot about sports. Brittany Griner has a, a little bit of hashish or marijuana extract with her when she enters Russia. She's arrested. She's tried. 
uh, and she's sentenced to 10 years of hard labor in a Siberian or some sort of remote prison. This turns out to be a triumph of the Enlightenment in certain respects. They didn't just kill her. They didn't just throw her into a prison or torture her and lock away the key, although I'm sure we'll learn more about her actual incarceration over time. Diplomats did what diplomats do in a world in which there is a, a set of conventions about diplomatic exchange, and she was eventually released and trade for a Russian person who was in prison in the United States. Yes, it's a disagreeable experience, but it wasn't a medieval world where she disappears into a dungeon and that's the end of that. The Enlightenment held, not perfectly, but it held. Yes, and um, maybe this isn't where you wanted to go with the Griner story, but I think it's moments like this that have the potential to be instructive. Griner happened to be a person who took during the uh, in the aftermath of the George Floyd murder was one who was one of those athletes who took a pronounced position regarding uh, standing uh, in a respectful posture relative to the national anthem. And she actually said uh, they should cease playing the national anthem yeah. at some of her sporting events. Yeah, and it was entirely within her right to say so and do so. Another part of the Enlightenment program, that protest is a, is a protected thing. Absolutely. But by the same token, the impulse to get her back, to spring her from some penal colony or wherever she would have ended up, uh, by uh, applying diplomatic pressure, trying to play the levers of international statecraft, uh, that speaks very highly of our political culture, because by the same token, and Russia's too, and Russia's and, too. And, and, and Russia's as well, although clearly less so. So, um, yeah, so there's an aspect of that that I think is, is germane to, because ultimately, Clay, the, the question becomes, where do, the, where do the ethical notions we operate by, where do they come from? And what is the source of moral conscience? Now, that's a much big, that's a, that's a topic I'm sure you're much more comfortable engaging in than I am. It's a very, it's, a, it's an important conversation. And I think the Enlightenment figures prominently in that dialogue, not exclusively. I mean, that is, the Enlightenment isn't the only basis for ethical behavior and, uh, and rational uh, uh, government of human affairs, but it's, but it's, a, but it's a prominent one. And, we, and we've taken for granted too much of what it has led to the backdrop of, of life in the modern world and modern America in particular. So she goes to Russia to um, make some money because uh, our um, women athletes, our female athletes in the WNBA are not paid adequately. So they all have to find another side gig and she goes there and she's um, caught with a, a quantity of um, an illegal substance. Uh, she is tried. Their system is, I think, um, pretty rough compared to ours, but she is tried. She has counsel. She uh, evidence is um, is entertained. She's allowed to confront her accusers. These are all Enlightenment uh, ideals. Mm -hmm. uh, then she's sentenced, and um, she appeals, and the appeal is denied. So there's another uh, Enlightenment structure: the appeal of a of a, of a judicial decision. Um, and she's going to pay the price. And, and I don't know whether in Russia she would have been freed after some portion of 10 years, but uh, the pardoning system and, and people not particularly having to fill out a full sentence is quite common in the Enlightenment world. And so uh, however imperfect Russia's behavior, and I certainly do not want to defend them in any way, uh, they were conforming to what we call Western liberal ideals. And again, in the exchange of her. That's good news. Had this been in 1700, imagine the difference. You know, habeas corpus is maybe the greatest single achievement in the history of, of, of the law because it means you can't just make her disappear. You have, to, you have to show her, you have to bring her in court so we can see that she's alive, that we can see that she's not been uh, tortured. And this is something that is so important. It wasn't even in the Bill of Rights. It's embedded in the Constitution of the United States itself. So from all those points of view, this is a good story in the Enlightenment. All right, so we're recording this in the last days of December 2022. The January 6th committee 
has just completed its work. Its report is forthcoming. Its summary is already out. And it has recommended a number of people for the Justice Department to consider indicting for crimes committed against the United States government in the January 6th attack on, on the US Capitol. We don't know where that's going, but I saw today that more than 960 people have been um, arrested um, because of the January 6th event. Um, 400 and some have pleaded guilty. I think 460 have pleaded guilty to crimes they committed and, and taken whatever punishment that brought. Um, 200 people have been um, imprisoned. Um, it's an amazing story. And the question is, how high will this go? And uh, Congressman Rankin, uh, who's on the committee, said uh, really fascinatingly, it just can't be the lower echelon, the, the people in the streets, it's the, 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 the army that gets, um, that has to pay the price for crimes like this, the ringleaders and the provocateurs and the people at the top, if it is a republic, also must pay a price, must face legal penalties for inciting or directing this sort of thing, if that can be shown to be true in a fair court of law. So think of this as a monument to the Enlightenment. This may or may not happen, Dave, but we are actually asking ourselves as a people of, of 340 million, has the former president of the United States committed a crime sufficiently obvious that we must indict him and put him on trial and possibly send him to prison? Think of that for a moment. I don't think it's likely to happen, but that's not the question. That, that we are actually standing at the portal of this and wondering if we should walk through this portal and hold accountable the highest echelon of our government for doing what is obviously a criminal thing, if it can be shown that they were uh, explicitly directing this insurrection. Yes, and that last phrase, Clay, is key to the proposition. That if it can be shown. If it can be shown, because I think it only reasonable people could agree that on the 6th of January, a crime was committed. Uh, the question is uh, level culpability and levels of culpability. Um, uh, I think we also need to stipulate that, again, again, this is an ethical premise of, of, of the Enlightenment and our jurisprudential system that you have, whether or not most people would, our system of law dictates that going into such a juridical process, the premise is that the former president is innocent. That's Until the start. proven guilty, and it'll be very difficult to prove such a thing. Yes, yes. Granted. And, yeah, you have to be the premise, and I, I guess some people on either side of that divide have to seriously do some self-introspection as to whether they can actually proceed on the basis of whether Trump ought to be presumed to be innocent. And I'm trying to be as fair and judicious in my own explication of this as I can. And we've, we've had a version of this conversation in private, and I appreciate the fact that we're on the record, uh, uh, and, um, and, and so we'll proceed from here. Human nature being what it is, I think the great risk is that if indictments proceed to trial, the risk, given the attenuated nature of the hold of enlightenment ethical standards on our political culture, the risk, Clay, is that it will simply become customary to find some pretext in the future to indict subsequent presidents by members of the opposite party. And so at root, and this I think you will personally find an unsatisfying answer, although I'm uh, I'm comfortable in stipulating it, invoking actually two other episodes in, in American history as my basis. 
and maybe for the first and only time in the history of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, someone is going to invoke President Gerald Ford as their model. But I think what Ford did Pardoning in, Mr. Nixon after the Watergate scandal. Pardoning Mr. Nixon after the Watergate scandal. That spoke highly, although some people viewed that with a scance. It was not universally accepted as the right thing to do. But maybe but cost I, Ford re-election the following year. Possibly. Uh, but um, so I think... Those who wish to proceed with prosecution need to accommodate into their worldview the law of unintended consequences in the future and how others going forward in less obvious circumstances will interpret the precedent, will interpret the Trump precedent as opposed to the Nixon precedent. But I want to go beyond to an even more credible source for an argument for um, consideration. And I'm referring to Lincoln's second inaugural. One of the greatest things ever uttered on the North American continent. In my view, it's a perfect second inaugural address that it's the greatest prose of any inaugural address. And it's one of the most magnificent and generous statements ever made by a president of the United States. Yes. Now the difference, just to find the, and 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 I consider that speech the single most redemptive aspect of American history. But let me go back to the Trump situation for a minute, because I think the Enlightenment gets even better marks here. Whatever you think of Donald Trump, he did leave the White House. He didn't surround himself with a Praetorian guard and shoot his way um, through that crisis. When the moment came, no matter what his rhetoric was, he left the White House, he packed up his affairs in moving vans, he got on the plane, and he went to Mar-a-Lago. In other words, there was a transition of power. In spite of all the crazy rhetoric, he left. That's number one. Number two, you saw in the 2022 elections, the midterm elections that just occurred in November, that the country has backed away somewhat from the incendiary brinksmanship that was represented during 2016 to 2020. Uh, and the candidates who were most likely to play the Trump card of this election was stolen, I refuse to concede, and so on, most of those more ardent candidates were repudiated by the American people. And the American people, in a sense, I think have said enough on the crazy front. We want regular order. We want rule of law. We want transitions. We want people to concede. We want elections to be regarded as definitive. And again, I think the, this is where Jefferson comes in. He said the people may not be deeply educated in anything, and they may make mistakes from time to time, and they may be led away by fanatical moments or waves of popular uh, opinion, but they have massive common sense. And in the end, they wind up usually doing the right thing. And I think Jefferson looking at this would say the guardrails held, the constitution held, Mr. Trump left office, um, that he did not uh, have a shootout at the white house, um, that he has, uh, he, whatever he says, he's, he's accepted the results of the election and is trying to run in the legitimate regular way to seek re-election in 2024. In other words, he hasn't said, I'm gonna to put together an army of, of men with AR-15s and we're gonna take the White House in 2024. He said, I'm running and I'll win. So from all of those points of view, you have to say the enlightenment is in okay shape. We're talking with Dave Nicandri of Washington State, formerly the director of the Washington State Historical Society formerly the director of the Washington State Historical Society, the author of three books and more coming. You are listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. We'll be back in just a moment.
Welcome back to the special edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. I'm Clay Jenkinson. David Swenson is on break. I'm talking to Dave McCandry, someone I've known now for a quarter of a century, and we've had some really marvelous adventures together on the Lewis and Clark Trail and many superb conversations. I'd say the best conversations I ever get to have about the Enlightenment are with you, and that's partly because no one else wants to talk about it, but here we go. <laughs> one thing you said, human nature being what it is, I think I might have said that too human nature being what it is. Here's, here's the divide between Jefferson and, and John Adams. Adams would say human nature being what it is, it crossed the Atlantic with the Mayflower and with every other crossing, and there's no good reason to think we're exempt from the human condition. And Jefferson would say, I'm not so sure. Maybe human nature is not as set as you think it is. Maybe under the right circumstances of everyone living on a quiet little farm and kind of a gardening situation and raising stock and reading Horace and Homer uh, in the original languages um, with education, really serious public education that gets to the very heart of what it is to live in a republic. And if we get the sort of the bogeys of the, the church and superstition and priests, doctrines like the Trinity and so on, clear those out from the human consciousness, we've never seen what's possible in human nature. So are we sure we want to lock it in as thoroughly as we do. I guess what I feel feel comfortable talking about is the difference between Jefferson and Adams, uh, Clay. Wouldn't it be fair to say that the basis of that divide, Adams placed more stock in, I guess what I'll call the Judeo-Christian moral code. Not that Jefferson completely scoffed at it. He mostly because, scoffed at it. Do you, is that fair? You think he mostly He's scoffed? He's a deist. I mean, he believes there's a God, but it's kind of a physics... God, and yeah, yeah. he believes in Jesus as an ethicist, but that's it. I believe that Adams at one point said the ethical, the Christian or Judeo-Christian ethical tradition was a prerequisite, effective functioning of the system of government that the Enlightenment brought together. Is that not true? That and is so correct. That, and that when, when, when you lose that grounding, there's certain ethical aspects of that tradition, too. I mean, be kind to your neighbor, stewardship of resources, golden rule, that kind of thing. So as that ethical standard dissipates, there's less lubrication in the system that pure rationalists, the Rousseau, Voltaire, Jefferson. I know who you said Jefferson said were his heroes, but he seems to be operating on the French system uh, of thought primarily. Jefferson believed that religion is okay if you're a Christian, if you're a Mohammedan, if you're Jewish. But he didn't think, historically speaking, that the church played as positive a role as you're saying that it did. Jefferson would say, yeah, you know, I, I wonder how much good religion has actually done in the world, if it were what you wish it were. I think maybe Gandhi said it the best when he said India would be all Christian if people actually acted according to the standard of the Christian faith, as opposed to, to how the, the imperial powers uh, behaved, of course, and people always fall short of that standard. There are excesses in every system. Let's move on to science, if we might. Indeed, we're talking to Dave McHenry. We're doing our retrospective of the last year or two and where the Enlightenment stands. And I was looking up today, sort of the 10 scientific highlights of the year 2022, and some of them actually <laughs> mystified me. I, I think they probably did to you, a new plastic that's been discovered. Well, nobody knows about it yet, but we're all going to know about it. There's a talk of, and this is really the heart of the Enlightenment, that scientists uh, using AI, that is artificial intelligence at Google, have discovered that they can map 200 million different proteins. They know exactly what is in 200 million different proteins. You can't do that with an abacus. You can't do that with a slide rule. That takes advanced computing, which is one of the signs of the great era that we are now in. Here are a couple that are sort of more within our capacity. The rings of Saturn. Best science now is that this happened 160 million years ago, that one of the moons, chrysalis, they're calling it, um, exploded somehow. It became apart. It fragmented. And the, the, the bits were made smaller and smaller and smaller the way um, the sand is at the seashore, and eventually they what's left of that cataclysm from 160 million years ago probably explains the rings of Saturn. I thought that was interesting, didn't you? 
Well, you did me the favor of sending me that list and I found it fascinating. I mean, my first metric play was to look, go down that list and determine which of these do I have any working knowledge. Exactly, me too. Of, of having happened. And, and a few jumped out at me for, um, uh, for um, different reasons. Some can of I them stop you there, Dave? Because both of us had this experience of like, is there anything here that I understand? And that tells you something about science. In other words, in the age of Jefferson, when Priestley is um, is um, isolating oxygen from air, or when Franklin is is, is putting a, a, a amber rod up against a balloon or something, we can kind of understand that or the circulation of the blood. But now we're in a zone where the science is so profoundly advanced that average, well-educated, well-read people like yourself find a lot of it just mystifyingly beyond our capacity to think about it yes but it but uh but that's always been the case to some extent uh all through time i mean there were uh, those earlier discernments whether in astronomy or biology i mean i'm sure at some point people thought the whole notion of uh, dna and other aspects of scientific even a heliocentric world i mean the earth is obviously not moving who what, what's this heliocentrism to take an example. But so the three in that list, Clay, that jumped out at me, um, the notion that human consciousness, and the phrase in the article was, involves quantum entanglement. <laughs> Strangely enough, that phrase quantum entanglement meant something to me because of a recent version of the old H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds, which has been appearing on, I see it on Canadian television, I think it's been on some other streaming service here in the United States. It's a British and French production, ultimately. What I understand quantum entanglement to be, the most graphic example of it, is when you see a flock of birds all moving simultaneous. I mean, thousands of fish moving in exactly the same speed, same direction, at the same time. How does that happen? Now try that on the L.A. freeway. You know, yeah. I mean, it's amazing that they can do this in coordination. And that I understand as quantum entanglement. And in fact, why humans have consciousness to begin with is perhaps the ultimate question. I mean, no other species that we know of on Earth seems to have this capability, although maybe my story about the fish and the birds. Not at uh, this level, let's say. Not at this not, level. Not, not at this level. The other one, and again, this is also out of science fiction, but when we sent up that rocket and altered the trajectory of an asteroid. Let me stop you right there. It's called DART. NASA launched it against an asteroid. Dimorphos, I think, is the name of the asteroid. And the fact that even that asteroids are even named is a Linnaean thing. But let's leave it at that for the moment. This is the absolute triumph and vindication of Isaac Newton, that a spinning Earth sends up a rocket to a asteroid that's sailing around the universe and we can it's like tom brady knowing where to place the football so somebody can catch it i'm just trying to keep it on your level you pass towards where you want the receiver to go and that we can actually send what amounts to a bullet something the size of a volkswagen we can send across the solar system and intersect a tiny object that is a 100 percent vindication of isaac newton's laws the football expression, Clay, is known leading a receiver. <laughs> I'm so sorry I don't have your lingo, but it's also in hockey. I know this, that Gretzky, he said, the reason he was so great is not because he's at the puck. He says, I know where the puck is going. I move towards where the puck is going to be. So yeah. uh, leading the receiver. So you, you, you accept the analogy that you have to lead the receiver on this asteroid. I completely agree. And you never know what aspects of scientific insight are going to prove to be ultimately revolutionary or, or transcendently important. But we know from geologic history and, bi and biology that asteroids have hit surface of the globe. And made a lot of trouble. Well, made, made a lot of, caused a lot of trouble. The life Farewell world. dinosaurs. And this is why the future always reveals what is important about the past. Now, there might be a lot of things that are said about 2022, 100 years from now, 1,000 years from now. But should it occur, just, uh, just have fun with this for a second, 1,000 years from now, 
that an asteroid is on a path to, Im to impact Earth with perhaps truly catastrophic consequences. That experiment will be looked at as not only the most, and it's and, and, and successfully deflected. What 2022 will be known for is that successful experiment, which was a six hours worth of news, maybe. So that was the second one on my list. Well, wait, before, wait, before you go to the third, we're going to run out of time here too, but that was a 600 kilogram capsule. In other words, almost no weight. It's like a garbage can filled with garbage. It was able to change the trajectory of that asteroid. This is where Archimedes comes in. He said, show me where to put the lever and I will move the world. You can take a small object this is sort of almost like the butterfly effect, but you can take a small object and hit an asteroid that's heading towards the earth and it might miss the earth now by 20 million miles because the tiniest difference at that distance is going to change the trajectory dramatically. Absolutely correct. And um, uh, the um, third one on my list is the James Webb telescope. If anything could beat Hubble, it's Webb. Yes, and, and and the upshot of this, as I as I think of it, Clay, is that we are getting <laughs> astonishingly close. I mean, truly, by being able to look back in time almost to the Big Bang itself. Uh, uh, I mean, within we're talking fifteen billion years writ large. Um, and so uh, we're, we're talking about a few thousand, few hundred, in, over the course of 15 billion years, 50,000 to 100,000 years isn't very many, but uh, it seems to me we're, we're, um, um, we're getting, again, stupefyingly close as a, as a species to being able to look back to the very creation of the universe. And that's, an, that's a remarkable accomplishment. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's, you, can, you can hardly overstate that. We, yes. we are, we're within shouting distance of being able to look back at the moment. And when you see, let's say that something is one light year away from Earth and we see something, what are we seeing? Something that happened a year ago. I predict that in our grandchildren's lifetime, we will be able to listen to sounds including historical sounds from the past. This is quantum mechanics again. So what did, it, what, what did Caesar say to his troops when they crossed the Rubicon? It is not outside the realm of possibilities that we will create instruments that can go listen to that. Uh, unbelievable if that occurred. Of course, it would almost shatter everything we think we know. Uh, before we lose each other, Artemis One going back to the moon and, and, and not so long from now, probably humans, including, I think uh, I've heard that, uh, that this will be a, a, an unprecedented uh, crew of, of multicultural origins, that's certain. Um, in evolution, it, you know, we, I grew up and we're about the same age when we used to hear about Leaky and the, and, and the Gorge and, and the origins of Lucy and so on. That's all shattered now. It goes way, way farther back, apparently, than we thought. Um, and it's a much more complicated trajectory than we thought, that, uh, that we were living in kind of an oversimplified view of the time when humans emerged from their predecessor species. I thought that was particularly interesting. A pig's heart that was genetically altered has been implanted in a human being, and it, it appears to be working. So we're not very far from designer kidneys and replacements of all sorts for human organs that fail. And, and then of course, the thing we don't haven't talked about, and it wasn't in this article because it's so fresh, fusion. And I don't even know what this means, but if we can, if we can find a way to continue this, to confirm it and to find applications for it, it could be almost what the alchemists thought of as the, the elixir, the universal energy solution to all problems. Of course, I think at this point, John Adams says, beware of the laws of unintended consequences. But what, what do you make of this fusion thing? Well, I, I think my only concern, I mean, it, was, it was a great breakthrough, seemingly a long time in coming, Clay. I mean, I'm in my mid-70s, and I can remember talking about the prospect of what fusion as an energy source might mean 
back in the 60s and 70s. So it's taken this long just to get uh, a, a single moment uh, of uh, net uh, increase in output uh, over uh, the over comp more than compensating for the energy to lead into it. Um, my only concern was or is that there might be the unrealistic expectation of how soon we can achieve the practical application of fusion. And it might uh, have a, a de disincentivizing effect on the urgency of global climate address. Yeah, and that would be a corollary to what I'm driving at. Yes, exactly, exactly right. We'll just hang on and there'll be a techno solution. So we're gonna be just fine, keep burning your coal. Yeah, precisely. I think that could easily happen. And of course, I, from a certain point of view, I think maybe Henry David Thoreau or Gandhi would say, oh, great, you want more energy for humans? <laughs> how, how well they use the energy they already are able to capture and, and, and apply. Exactly. So, okay, so we got to close. We're, we're over time, but this has been really interesting. I hope, I hope you agree too, to try to assess the status of the enlightenment. And I think that we're giving it kind of a B minus here, but we're not in despair over it but we're alarmed, we're concerned. And on science, it's just like breathtaking in every direction and uh, keeping up is going to be the problem. But if you think that, um, you know, those ads on television that, you know, um, General Electric is doing good things for you, mm -hmm. uh, brace yourself because we're moving into an era when the capacity of computing is going to generate just, um, infinite new possibilities for technology. Yeah, I think in conclusion, Clay, all I can say is basically reiterate something I said at the beginning of the conversation, uh, which is that, the, that uh, our capacity to take advantage of the uh, practical outcomes of the scientific res uh, revolution, the uh, technological, uh, that seems unabated, sometimes almost <laughs> frighteningly so, in terms of the, the shock value of, 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 of what, what, what might be possible. There's uh, always room for improvement on the moral uh, philo philosophical sphere, uh, but uh, it's ever going to be such, I believe. Thank you, David McCandry. It's such a pleasure. We'll meet this time next year and see what 2023 gave. There will be hard to beat some of these scientific achievements and breakthroughs in 2022, but I'll bet we'll be equally impressed when we look back We've been following the Enlightenment today on this special edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, and we will see you all next week for another important edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is brought to you each week by Dakota Sky Education. The program is distributed nationally by Prairie Public. President Thomas Jefferson lived from 1743 to 1826, and this program presents his views. President Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author Clay S. Jenkinson. This program is also available online at jeffersonhour.com and on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to correspond with President Jefferson or submit a question for him to answer on the program, please visit the website at jeffersonhour.com. Bach Cello Suite Number no. 3 in C Major by Stephen Swinford. Thank you for listening. Please tune in again next week for another thought-provoking, historically accurate program